You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 7, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, specific IgE testing. Our presenter is Dr. Brock Williams. He's affiliated with the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Now I'd like to update a little bit on allergen research, uh, kind of in general. That's a, a lecture in itself. But the important points are that the number of allergens are actually quite low, uh, the relevant allergens, and uh, they're quite prevalent, and there's a lot of cross-reactivity, and we'll get into that. And uh, all these things sort of influence the, uh, our interpretation of IgE results, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about components and the future uh, perspectives. I uh, have nothing to disclose, uh, except I am on the Speakers Bureau for Thermo Fisher, formerly Pharmacia, but I've never given a lecture for them. Uh, I'd like to tell you what that tire is doing up in that tree, but we don't have time. <laughs> so, um, as sort of a marker of my transitions between those subjects, I thought uh, I could get some audience participation, but uh, so uh, you can think this, whisper it or yell it or say it. So uh, that actually just marks uh, where I'm jumping around from different subjects. So uh, I hesitate to show something this simple, but uh, this is the basic diagram. We all know about Ig uh, or radio or, or immune assays. Uh, and they essentially involve the binding of, a, of Ig to a, a solid phase allergen. Uh, I'll point out there's many different substances on there other than allergen. Uh, we use an enzyme that's uh, got a marker on it to uh, bind to that Ig, and that's the amount of enzyme uh, that uh, a substrate that's uh, metabolized by the enzyme is proportional to how much IgE was found. Um, since uh, Ig was discovered in '66 uh, and uh, codified in '67. We uh, we've seen a really uh, a flourishing number of assays developed, and commercial people got into this, and it's really developed. Uh, all these had different allergen sources and preparations, different coupling chemistries, solid phases were different. Uh, there was a lot of differences, so all these assays sort of worked, but didn't really work. Uh, up to par. It's, it kind of reminds me of Kevin's slide that they were somewhat imprecise and inaccurate. Uh, one of the problems is they're all referred to RAS tests, uh, which is incidentally obsolete. But they, they, um, in doing so, uh, everyone kind of lumped them into one big group. And so if one had good performance and one had poor performance, you couldn't tell because they're all called RAS tests. It's one reason we're trying to get that uh, word out of the literature. Okay. They're all reported in uh, log uh, related results. And for some reason, I got a blank screen on that. I, let's see. Yes, I did. Is your screen blank, blank there? Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, okay. Um, I, don't, I don't quite understand that one, but. Um, just, oh, shows I, blank white, white, just shows blank white squares. Oh no! I see. It's it's actually if you look carefully, it's in white. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. White on white. Oh. Yeah, white on white. Okay. That's a clever way of hiding things. Anyway, everything you know, we've always seen these log-related classes and not really understood what that means. It's kind of a stupid thing to do, really, to to try to report these out in classes and log-related ones, which not many people are really aware of that. Uh, it, it, it sort of uh, was done, I think, in the first place to correlate with skin testing classes, so like you know, one through four, and uh, most of the, the assays for specific IAG were one through six or one through five. And actually, that 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 certainly uh, diminishes the value of a quantitative assay, and at the same term, it exaggerates others that are not quantitative. It makes them look like they're all the same again, and they're not. 
so there was a, a with all this mess that came about, with all these different assays and uh, their different performance characteristics, um, there are a lot of discrepancies. There are variable results with clinical standards, which is a little understandable because we didn't have any clinical standards. Uh, quantitation was questionable in most of those assays. And uh, there, there were good examples. And it was usually one particular allergen. Uh, for example, uh, Codfish M allergen, which is really uh, parv albumin, was purified, and, it, and when you ran a test uh, with a paper disc system, it was 100% sensitive, 100% uh, specific. But uh, that was really the exception, and uh, in those days we didn't purify allergens. Now, one thing I might point out that the sensitivity has always been proclaimed to be below skin testing, and that's never really been proven, I don't think. It was just said. Uh, and we had uh, a lot of politics and economics involved in our, all these uh, criticisms and, uh, and the fighting that went on between skin testing and specific IgE measurements. And this sort of led the allergist to uh, boycott all of specific IgE. And I, I like to show this slide. Um, and I had some specific comments. But I just want to emphasize the point that uh, uh, it, it created some rather uh, uh, high walls between the science of IgE and, uh, and practice of allergy. So I want to do a, a few things, uh, just a few important points about immunochemistry. If you think about it, uh, when we're measuring uh, one nanogram of IgE, that's six billion molecules. That's a lot. And one international unit of IgE is 2.42 nanograms. And thus, these are mass action. Um, uh, th these things follow the law of mass action in, uh, in their binding. And the range uh, of 0.35 to 100 uh, units is 5 uh, to uh, a trillion molecules. So, so you're really measuring a lot of things. And, and it really depends upon the equilibrium binding of the antigen and the antibody. And the importance of this is that you can do a little uh, mathematics, a simple algebra really. And, and if you take the affinity binding and the number of sites available on a, a particular solid phase over 1 plus the affinity in the binding sites, if this ratio is greater than 10, then the assay is affinity independent. If it's lower than that, it's affinity dependent. And I'll take an example here uh, of if you have a 10 to the 8 Ka and 10 to the minus 8 binding sites, uh, uh, 10 nanomolar, uh, the, the, you'll, you can only bind 50% of the antibody, no matter what the concentration is. So that would be an affinity dependent assay. And so the importance of this is that uh, for an assay to actually work, uh, it, it has to be, uh, ha you have to have a lot of the particular allergen that you're binding on the solid phase. And we know, of course, that coated wells have very little. Uh, coated beads uh, have very little. Paper discs have some. And we know that the immunocap solved a lot of these problems by having a huge surface area. And, and that certainly uh, made it more amenable to quantitation and uh, uh, accuracy. I, I, I'll skip this one, but I'll give it. Essentially, what happens when you have an affinity-dependent assay is that as you dilute, uh, as you you have these are three samples uh, with Timothy-specific Ig, Timothy Grass Ig, and this is what they should result in but they actually result in these lower curves with the triangles and because this is an affinity dependent assay and what happens is you can't tell the difference between this dilution this dilution and this dilution and and so you're not really getting a real measurement a real quantitative measurement well why is that important it's important because that's how we standardize allergens when you standardize allergens it's usually done on a microtiter surface and, and therefore, uh, it's an affinity-dependent assay unless it's a purified allergen. 
and, and that's uh, uh, and so so uh, we we shouldn't really be too proud of the way we standardize uh, allergens uh, to this date because uh, allergen extracts because we measure only one allergen and usually do it with an affinity dependent assay. Uh, similarly, when we look at stability studies, when we mix allergen extracts and uh, uh, supposing that there's a proteolytic enzyme in there, um, we, if we measure what's uh, there after a certain period of time and are using a affinity dependent assay, then you're not going to see any changes, even though uh, a lot of your uh, allergen may have been digested by a particular protease. So we have to be careful in those two instances to uh, interpret uh, results in lieu of those uh, contingencies. Now, FDA approves assays. And uh, they, they have two methods. One is the predicate device method, and that relies on manufacturer's data. And it somewhat assures mediocrity, because if I licensed, or if I had a test, previous test that, that was approved, and I come up with a new test, then I want it to compare with, with the old test. And so if you had come up with a better test, it probably doesn't compare very well with the old test and you'd have trouble getting a better test licensed. In place of that is the 510K process, and, and that's very rigorous. Uh, and it's very costly. And it involves a definition of the assay components, the uh, antibodies uh, used to identify the Ig, it's, it's the, their specificity. You have to identify the source of allergens, precision profiles over the range that have to be published. And, uh, lot to lot comparisons, linearity of the assay, real time stability, the limits of detection, uh, analytical spe uh, specificity, and uh, they actually FDA requires a hundred negatives and and as many positives as you can come up with, and we know that's problematic with rare allergens that you, you really can't find that many positives. But in recent applications, the number of positives tested has been between 24 and 94. And of course, there are a lot of other regulations that regulate uh, laboratories running these tests, including uh, very rigorous proficiency testing, personal uh, uh, personality, uh, personal, uh, person, personal. I didn't, I misspelled it. Uh, requirements and and there's extensive record keeping. I can tell you, any laboratory you can you can ask which lot did you use uh, on which date with which sample they can tell you. And it's uh, uh, because of this, uh, you shouldn't compare this with skin testing uh, because it really shows a big contrast between the amount of uh, quality control and insurance uh, assurance that are uh, applied to the two different uh, uh, modalities. So let's talk about uh, the analytical performance uh, of assays, and, and that you say, well, I, I want to, uh, I want to test these assays to see which one gives me the best results, and the best results are those that have the best performance characteristics, as far as precision, accuracy, uh, and quanti uh, quantification. So what we did, <coughs> in uh, this is back in 2000. We sent samples out uh, containing variable amounts of specific Ig to laboratories, blinded, and we and we presented some of these in a dilution series, and uh, we sent these to five different laboratories, and I'm only going to present the data on three of them, but um, they were all analyzed to uh, they were sent through physicians' offices, by the way, uh, so the laboratories didn't catch on to what we were up to. And they were analyzed to 17 different uh, common arrow allergens, and that's 12,000, 13,000 uh, tests that we analyzed. And to kind of uh, shortly summarize those, uh, uh, we we looked at the slope of the dilutions to see if they were uh, gave us a uh, on a semi-log curve gave us a slope of one, and what. Uh, we did that with ordinary least squares regression analysis, and uh, a slope of one means that if you dilute something in half, you get half as much, and etc. 
And we found that with uh, three of these different methods, we found that uh, that two of the methods did not give us a very good uh, uh, slope, uh, that, uh, a slope that compared to one. And one method gave us a wonderful uh, correlation with one, was 93%. But more significantly, uh, these two assays gave us slopes that were not significant. That means the assays could not tell the difference between one dilution and another. And that's, uh, those are not very good assays uh, for those particular allergens. So, uh, so th that was quite astounding. And uh, we've seen similar studies with single allergens uh, that, that show the same thing. So the, these methods A and B might have respectable slopes for some allergens, but uh, not for others. And that probably uh, reflects the quality of the allergen extract that they use to uh, uh, put on their solid phases. We also uh, measured uh, precision with those samples. And that was uh, uh, reported as a percent CV, which is the standard de deviation over the mean as a percent. And we found that uh, these methods gave us, uh, methods A and B gave us quite large ranges uh, of CVs, whereas one method gave us a very good uh, close range uh, of 9.8% average uh, with a range of 7 to 13%. So this is, uh, this is a pretty good assay, and these are uh, uh, somewhat questionable. Uh, one reason it's important not to have a large CV is, is particularly, well, you can't be quantitative. Uh, for example, if you plot the, uh, the proportion of uh, people with, with uh, the probability of them having symptoms versus the sum of their IgE antibody concentrations, and you have a CV of 25%, you have a very large error range. So you, you can't really tell where you are. I might make a comment, I will make a comment about this. With, we're, with skin testing, and this is with histamine, not allergens, we're looking at it, uh, we're trying to hit a target of 30% CV. So obviously you can't be very quantitative with a skin test if, uh, if that's the case. Another way of comparing how well tests compare to each other is a bland Altman plot. This is a log plot. My arrow keeps disappearing here. Uh, it's, a, it's a log plot of the differences uh, between the results of various allergens across a range of, of measurement, a measurement range. And you can see that these three assays uh, do not compare very favorably because the, 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 the favorably comparison would be around the plus or minus 20 percent, which where these dashed lines would be. Now this doesn't tell you which one's right. We use the immunocap as, uh, as the standard here. But um, you could have used Immunolite or TurboRAS to compare that to, and you get something uh, quite similar. So how do you tell which assay is right? Well, we use chimeric antibodies uh, to, to do this. And these are humanized uh, uh, antibodies uh, uh, that were monoclonals from mite directed against a particular allergen. and uh, we presented these samples three times to different laboratories running different methods, and we asked them to, to assay it for total IgE and also for specific IgE to those particular allergens. And the trick here is that the specific E should equal the total E. Well, it turns out that uh, our uh, our, our expected measurement was 40 kilo-units of IgE, and, and we had these various dilutions. Um, and uh, the other assays uh, for total IgE actually correlated quite well with that. So they all came up with a pretty good measurement of total IgE. And in fact, if you look at CAP surveys um, for laboratories, total IgE assays are really quite well controlled and very comparable. When we looked at specific Ig, we got something different. We expected 40 kilo-units at the number one dilution and to dilute out, and we found one assay correlated quite well with that. But another assay uh, showed much lower uh, numbers. 
and while in other assays showed much higher numbers. And this is the status of the assays that were that are actually available that are approved and available uh, in the U.S. today. And that one of them works quite well, and the other two are somewhat questionable. These results have been repeated with uh, not only with mite but birch uh, and about seven other different allergens now, and the results are quite similar. So um, we know that different assays for Ig don't give comparable or interchangeable results, and you have to be careful about that. And one of the problems is that because of various uh, insurance contracts, you have to send your samples to uh, uh, prescribed laboratories, and you don't have any control over it. When in fact you actually do, you can request them to run it by a method that you can trust. Uh, so, that, uh, but a lot of doctors aren't aware of that. They just send it out for uh, a specific Ig testing, and uh, and and they get sometimes get uh, rather poor results. The studies on clinical interpretations of most of the in vitro tests depend on the method used, of course, but they also depend on the clinical standard. And the clinical standards we have are less than perfect. So uh, we have to take most of the studies on clinical sensitivity and specificity uh, with a grain of salt. We do have accurate, precise, and quantitative results for specific IG, and, and there are around 342 uh, different uh, uh, extract, allergen extract-based tests that are, have been approved uh, uh, that are accurate, precise, and quantitative. Now, I will point out that, that in the laboratory, we talk about analytical sensitivity and specificity. And, and sometimes these are really confused with clinical sensitivity and specificity, and they're very different animals. And, uh, uh, we'll have some comments in that further in the lecture. A quick word about cutoffs. Everybody tried to make their assay seem to be the most sensitive assay on earth when it may not have much clinical re relevance. And, and what's, what they actually do is they, they take 3.3 standard deviations from the mean of the negatives, and that gives you the 95% cutoff of, uh, uh, well, actually, it's two-ended, so it's two and a half percent cutoff, a little wiggle room on this uh, on the cutoff. Most assays uh, today actually don't do 3.3 standard deviations because these distributions of the negatives and the positives are very different. So they give you 10 to 50 standard deviations from the mean of the negatives as a cutoff. And this is a very poor slide, but but we use uh, 0.35 as a cutoff in most of these assays, and you can see that it certainly uh, certainly goes down below that, and is still somewhat linear at, at that point. So they can measure below that, but the clinical relevance is certainly questionable, and uh, and so the the cutoff in these areas is probably uh, not particularly relevant. Okay, how about analytical specificity? Uh, that's the ability to measure what you think you're measuring. And we use immunoblots and in inhibition assays to prove that. Now this is, uh, these are some immunoblots of patients' profiles to a particular allergen extract. And in between them, and you can't see these, because they've run the test, and then they see if the solid phase removed all these specificities and they certainly did in all four cases. So you can prove that that you are essentially uh, you're, you're essentially measuring with your test all these different specificities. Okay, uh, this is an allergen extract on a two-dimensional gel. The first dimension is, uh, is here uh, and it's separation by size, and the second dimension is isoelectric focusing by charge. And you can see uh, this is probably true of most all allergen extracts. Well, which one's the allergens? Uh, which, which are allergens, which are relevant, which are not relevant, is uh, certainly uh, a big problem. 
And actually, in most cases, or many cases, the relevant allergen in an allergen extract may be a minor contaminant. When we measure IgE, uh, we can we can take a this is true for almost any particular allergen. If we uh, electrophoresis the uh, the allergen extract and then immunoblot it with different patient serum, we get these different patterns. In other words, we get uh, we get some people that have no antibody, no Ig antibody. We get others that bind to many things in in there, uh, and they're different. So when you get a specific Ig result, you're getting the sum total of these if you have a decent assay. And this is a uh, uh, this is part of the confusing part of this because you can see that if this was the relevant allergen, then uh, this patient might have a whole lot of IgE, but doesn't have anything to the relevant allergen, and therefore uh, uh, would essentially be a positive in vitro test with a negative uh, clinical history. So, uh, as you know, we're starting to define these relevant allergens, and I'll get into that in just a minute. So, extract-based tests. Uh, which almost all the specific Ig tests have been, are uh, they're, they're they're dependent on how good allergen extracts are, and we all know that allergen extracts are quite heterogeneous. We uh, know very little about the stability of allergen extracts. Uh, and they're variable lot to lot. They're variable to from manufacturer to manufacturer, and we know now that the extracts we use for skin testing that that uh, uh, there's only 19 of them that are actually semi-standardized, and there's 12,069 that are actually licensed. So those are all used for in vitro tests and for skin testing. So obviously, we could see uh, variability in both. Um, okay. So, so I want to get into a few comments about IgE, which can actually influence. Uh, testing results. And I hesitate to show these type of cartoons because I think they, they don't really show reality, but you can make a couple points with them. One point is is that we, we obviously know that allergen can attach to IgE on mast cells and uh, uh, bring them together and trigger uh, calcium input and trigger the cells to uh, release uh, their mediators. Uh, another really important feature of the IgE system is that it can present allergen. We call this targeting. It can hold on to the allergen and make it available for the recognition by other B cells that have Ig have have uh, 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 immunoglobin on their surface and can recognize it. And therefore, you start making antibody to other determinants on this molecule. So you really target a molecule. Uh, also, we know that, that uh, with antigen presenting cells, uh, we know that uh, once a TH2 cell is stimulated, it secretes IL-4, 10, uh, 13, and we know that that stimulates, uh, that, uh, that can cause a, a switch to Ig production. Well, this is kind of important in the bystander effects because uh, if you have uh, the release of, uh, if you have the stimulation of TH cell, TH2 cells in a particular area of your body, usually in the skin and mucosal surfaces, that you've created a milieu for making more IgE. And what happens then uh, is that if an allergen comes in and causes an allergic reaction, then it stimulates I, more IgE synthesis to everything around it in its environment. So you're making IgE to everything else that that comes along with the allergen, and a lot of that IgE is probably irrelevant to disease. Um, some could be, but most of it is probably irrelevant, and that's IgE is measured obviously in uh, in specific IgE tests and also in skin testing. Uh, it's kind of interesting that in the mucosa. Uh, uh, of atopic individuals, 4% of their B cells are actually dedicated to IgE synthesis uh, and are, 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 are IgE presented, are IgE 
surface uh, B cells, and 12 to 19 percent of them are uh, uh, the plasma cells, or can be 12 to 9 percent of the 19 percent of the plasma cells. So obviously, Ig production in these individuals uh, with atopy is certainly encouraged by the, the by the milieu that they have there. Um, so, and normals have very few of these, if any. So we know about local synthesis, uh, and the milieu just creates more of it. We know about targeting effects, uh, and we know about the bystander effects, amplification through IL-33 and mast cells, which also uh, secrete uh, IL-4 and also enhance uh, this milieu. Uh, we don't know much about clonicity uh, of IgE. And, and I give you an example, perhaps, that if you have targeting and you keep targeting the same molecule, well, you're going to make a lot of different clones to that particular molecule. Well, what if you make so many that it no longer, uh, that one clone blocks another in, in making it less effective as a bridger of uh, the allergen on a, on a mast cell. We don't know much about that at all. We don't know much about affinity, but we, Ig antibodies are, are usually fairly high affinity. Uh, the concentration effects, uh, we don't uh, really know a lot about that. Uh, we, we're learning more with these components, but uh, uh, right now we don't really know what concentration effects of Ig are. And um, we discussed this the other night about specific activity. That would be the amount of specific Ig over the total IgE. Is that an important parameter? It's kind of how big of a slice of pie do you have dedicated to any particular allergen? And uh, actually, some new findings suggest that that may not be too relevant. And we'll get into that in a second. I wanted to make another comment about this, but I, I think I mean I, I think you you get the picture that when you're measuring IgE with an extract-based test, you're measuring uh, IgE to quite a few different components, some of which are cross-reacting uh, from uh, that you might have been cross-sensitized to uh, from another source. So. When we're looking at IgE, if, if you look at a large number of patients with a lot of IgE tests uh, looking at them, it was found that you could cluster their reactivity into essentially 12 related clusters, uh, which is quite surprising, actually, uh, because we used to think that IgE could be made against any particular uh, protein whatsoever. Uh, it doesn't seem to be true because of these studies. Okay. Uh, there's a, a really important study that was done uh, a couple of years ago and uh, very similar to the previous one where they looked at uh, some 5,000 serum and they did 90, 99 uh, specific Ig tests on each, extract-based Ig tests. The total e, they, they then uh, uh, looked at their total E in each sample and the accumulated specific IgE. And you, you'd kind of assume if you ran 99 tests that, that you pick up most of the IgE in there. Uh, but it turned out that the actually the percent of specific e, e over the total IgE was only about 20 to 30 uh, percent of the, of the total IgE. So it was, that was a quite surprising result. They also, in this paper, show that as the I, total IgE goes up, the number of positive tests actually increases, which suggests that as IgE goes up, that it's uh, essentially you're just broadening your reactivity uh, of the IgE. You're making it against more things. Uh, motifs are the part of the allergen that are actually recognized by IgE. And if you break down extracts on the basis of their motives, you come down that each there are fewer motives recognized than extracts, which means there's more commonality between these extracts than we recognized before. And, and this number came up to be uh, uh, three. And 
on average. And so that means that actually this 20 to 30 percent maximum of the total E is actually below 10 percent. So of the IgE that you're measuring, uh, uh, it's probably below 10 percent specific for any given allergen or motive. Uh, when they looked at the samples that had the 99 tests on them, they, they found that very few of these tests were monopositive. In other words, uh, uh, these motives are common to different extracts, and, and it's very, uh, this, it, this may be a falsely high number mainly because uh, they haven't identified all the motives. So there's a relatively small number of uh, allergens, and perhaps a few number, uh, a small number of recombinant proteins might suffice to predict all sensitizations. So we know about allergens. We know uh, they're classified into major and minor. Uh, they use the uh, first three letters of the genus and species to, uh, uh, and the order of their discovery to describe them. The problem with this nomenclature is that it's, uh, it's uh, named in order of their identification and it actually only identifies their source. No relation to structure or function it precludes the ability to identify relationships. Uh, and it's kind of hard to remember. Uh, similar allergens might be given different numbers, such as FELD4 in the cat and CANF2 are quite similar allergens and uh, cross-react. Um, so we've seen over the last 20 years an incredible amount of information on allergens has been accumulated. And this is through cloning and expression. We know their sequences. We know uh, their protein families, their motifs, uh, their functions. This has created a huge database, uh, several databases, and it sort of represents the marriage of genomics, proteomics, and bioinformatics. In fact, we got some very pretty pictures of uh, these are FABs uh, binding to uh, allergens. So this is uh, grass. Uh, uh, this is beta lactoglobulin. This is BLAG2, the aspartic protease of uh, uh, cockroaches, and BETV1, which is a PR10 protein, which uh, is common among many plants and, and foods. So uh, we know now that uh, there are actually in nature around 12,000 different types of proteins that can be put into families. And you look at how many of those families have allergenic proteins, and it turns out to be quite small. It's around 2% of the total protein families have allergens in it. And most of these families contain multiple allergens, uh, uh, or multiple proteins which are allergenic. So allergens comprise a small fraction of protein families with particular biological functions and structures. Uh, we know these the functions of most of uh, these allergens are the proteases or glycosidases, their lipid transfer proteins or lipocalins, storage proteins, pathogenesis related proteins, prophylins, carbalbumins, uh, which causes fish allergies, and the tropomyosin, the shrimp, and, the, uh, and, and perhaps insect allergies. So, what, why do I bring this up? We all know that uh, we can now test to spe these specific components and, uh, and see if you have IgE antibody to any of these. And then we can dissect that out to see if those are really relevant. Ah, that's pretty nice. Uh, that, that's really going to be a paradigm change in allergy. And uh, I think most of you are familiar with peanut, where we know that Air H2 uh, if you measure specific IgE of that, you get 100% sensitivity to the test. Uh, these, are, these are actually challenges. And 96% specificity. Whereas if you use a whole extract, you get, certain, you get sensitivity, but you certainly lose specificity. So it, it, uh, it certainly seems to uh, uh, pay off to use these uh, specific molecules for diagnosis. Now, I don't know what happened to this slide, but uh, it it kind of shows the components of peanuts, and we know that ARH2 is very important. 
in different populations uh, in southern Europe, ARH9 might be uh, more important because more of these people are sensitized to this protein from other sources but react to peanuts because of that. Um, we also know that you can have a positive uh, PR10 uh, response to peanuts and probably only this probably only results in oral allergy as the PR10 proteins are rather unstable to digestion and so you can get itching from that but and you'd have a positive in vitro test and a positive skin test but perhaps uh, uh, no really uh, severe symptoms I think I'll eliminate that one uh, this is some findings from Jim Thompson uh, uh, that I think are quite interesting in showing the the percent of people that are sensitized by age to different uh, components of peanut and you can see that young children and this is uh, young children and uh, as they get a little older this diminishes to to quite a slim number of people allergic to only the storage protein which is ARH2, ARH1, 2, and 3 actually. Uh, so the diagnosis by IgE actually changes with age and these older individuals actually have a much higher proportion of their antibody to PR10 proteins which, uh, uh, which actually is, is good uh, but it also means that they're much more sensitive to different pollens uh, uh, and uh, so, so you can see these different changes, which this kind of means that we're probably going to have to uh, interpret our tests uh, not only on the relevant allergens, but also on age, and that'll certainly affect how we approach their treatment. I would, uh, there are a lot of databases now available, and I'd really encourage everyone to peruse these. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, the the all fam database is really pretty simple and really describes allergen families uh, quite nicely and you can it's very easy to use and uh, uh, all these just uh, just bunch them up on the computer and uh, the SDAP is a good way of looking for uh, uh, allergens that are listed uh, and and uh, you can they it's a very large database so you can, and the allergome shows you a lot of literature references on each one of these allergens. So these are rather large databases, and I think allergists are going to have to become very familiar with all of these. So in summary, uh, many allergens have been thoroughly characterized. Uh, many clinically relevant allergens have been identified. Relationships among different sources have been identified, and uh, uh, the components. I think are really going to be solve a lot of the problems that we had earlier with uh, with the different tests, whether they be affinity dependent or not, or if they didn't correlate with clinical picture or not. And now we understand why, and and obviously that really represents uh, a big paradigm shift in in uh, the diagnosis of allergy. So I got it. How much time do I have, Jay? Oh, okay. I, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, you have about six six more minutes. Okay, a couple little CME questions, and then I I'll get into something else. Um, my that camera covers me up, so I'm gonna. Whoops, no. But we can see you when you're presenting. Then it it doesn't it covers up your picture. Okay. Huh. There you go. Okay, CME question. When summing the specific IG from a large number of tests, what would you expect the percent of specific IG to total IG to be? Um, it's, uh, this is kind of a trick question because the answer is E, but it's actually probably below that, uh, 10 to 20 percent of all, your, all, all the IG in a patient is probably specific. Doesn't that depend on what the total IgE is? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, uh, it seems to be pretty, uh, pretty consistent in spite of what the total IgE is as you go across the range. 
And, and so as you increase the total IGE, you also increase uh, you, you, the percentage stays the same, but you obviously have more to uh, these individual proteins. Um, another thing that another thing that where we've you know uh, Hugh Sampson and uh, other people have gotten into this uh, uh, they published papers showing that uh, if your IgE goes up to a certain level then you're more apt to react to uh, uh, a particular uh, uh, allergen source and if you think about that a little bit and you think about components as your IgE goes up, the chances that you make IgE to a relevant protein also go up. So I would I would guess that that when we were we were kind of excited about looking at this uh, the number of people that would uh, react increases as the total IgE increases, then it looks like you're just increasing your chances of making antibody to a relevant allergen. And that also means that if you have a small amount of IgE, it could be directed against the relevant allergen. And to me that's an explanation of why IgE levels don't uh, don't necessarily correlate with with disease because a low level might you might have someone with quite severe disease and a high level um, or a higher level uh, they may not. So, so it really depends on the relevant allergen in, that, in those cases. Okay, the percentage of protein families that contain allergens, it's around 2%. That's quite low. Oh, I didn't talk about common properties of allergens because this wasn't really focusing on allergens, but um, they they have some common properties. They're they're uh, usually heat stable. They're usually stable through digestion, and and these are uh, properties in favor of them making IgE because they hang around longer. Uh, they do almost all of them tend to form polymers, and so that would help in the cross linking of IgE on the surface of the base of mass cell. They are not infrequent in nature. Uh, and many of these, uh, it's kind of interesting that many of these proteins are involved in protection. Uh, the uh, pathogenesis related proteins in, from plants, there's about 14 different groups of those identified and four of those are, uh, are uh, quite commonly allergens. If you look at uh, the latex food syndromes, you, you can find that uh, there there are uh, 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 chitinases in there that are designed to for the plant to uh, fend off insects, uh, and so that's that's their protective ability, uh, and also mold. And when plants are stressed, they make more of these uh, these allergens. So um, they they almost all of them are involved in the protection of the of the plant. Um, and of course, they do different FDA-approved assays yield comparable results, and they certainly do not. Uh, so that's uh, that's about all I have. So uh, if there are any particular questions, I think I think uh, kind of summarizing this, we've come a long ways in making the assays much better, much more uh, reproducible. Uh, and accurate and quantitative, uh, but at the same time, now we've come to understand what we're actually measuring with these and how, what their relationship is to disease. So, I think we've we've really uh, turned a corner on some of this, and and I think that uh, it will certainly change the the future of allergy. And I, I can see probably in the future will be uh, the treatment will be with specific allergens probably in combination with some immunomodulator that uh, favors TH1 type of responses or uh, or memory cells so uh, I think that's nice and it also brings allergy alongside other uh, medical fields 
as far as technology is concerned. And I think that's very important because uh, it's kind of like the cardiologist doesn't really care if a, a family physician prescribes Lipitor uh, because he has tools that uh, the family physician doesn't have and, and, uh, and understandings. So uh, I think that bodes well for uh, the, the field of allergy and also for, uh, for uh, better treatments better outcomes. So. Wow. It's certainly an exciting time, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to be able to see where we were going wrong in the past. <laughs> you know. All right. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Brock. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to have to stop here. It's noon. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.